Tonight at 10, the news presenter Hugh Edwards has been identified as the man at the centre of allegations over payments for sexually explicit images. A trusted face for millions, he's now in hospital receiving treatment for mental health issues. He's the face of the BBC in many ways, particularly in terms of news. Absolutely. I don't think it's quite such a shock. I think the speculation has been so rampant for the last few days that it's more a relief in a sense than a shock. The Sun newspaper says it will not be printing any more allegations as the Metropolitan Police decides no criminal offence has been committed. We'll assess the full legal implications of the controversy as the BBC resumes its own investigation into the news presenter's conduct. Also tonight. At the NATO summit, G7 leaders formally agree long-term security commitments to defend Ukraine. The Bank of England warns almost a million households will pay more than £500 more a month for their mortgages. And drama at Wimbledon as the defending women's champion Elena Rybakina is knocked out in the quarterfinals. On BBC London, necessary to help congestion or bad for the environment? We take a look at the controversy over London's first road tunnel in 30 years. Good evening. He is one of the most recognisable faces on British television, anchoring coverage of major national and international events, often from this very chair. But tonight, Hugh Edwards, the lead anchor of the BBC's News at 10, has been revealed as the man at the centre of allegations over the payment of thousands of pounds to a young person for explicit pictures. He was identified in a statement on his behalf by his wife who said he's now receiving inpatient hospital care, having suffered a serious mental health episode after what have been five extremely difficult days. Hugh Edwards has not resigned from the BBC. The statement went on to say that once well enough, he intends to respond to the stories that have been published. All this, as the Metropolitan Police, having reviewed the allegations, said there's no evidence of a criminal offence having been committed. Hugh Edwards' statement says, once well enough, to do so, he intends to respond to the stories that have been published. As the BBC Tonight resumes its own inquiry into his conduct, the Sun newspaper says it won't be printing any more claims. There are questions tonight over the conduct of the tabloid in its first reporting of the allegations, and we'll be assessing the ongoing legal implications, as well as reflecting on what the controversy means for the BBC. But first, here's our culture editor, Katie Razzle, on the dramatic events of the last few hours. Tonight at 10, we're in Edinburgh, where the King has been presented with the crown jewels of Scotland. Named, and likely a huge shock to many viewers. The ceremony was steeped in tradition. Wednesday was the last time Scotland Hugh Edwards appeared on BBC News, that BBC night from Edinburgh. Members of the England's next day, the BBC quietly took him off air. Now, the secret that has been speculated upon across social media for days is public. At the end of the month, Hugh Edwards, India, the main face of the BBC's flagship the News at 10 for two decades, is the presenter at the centre of allegations of misconduct. China's this evening, his wife Vicky Flind released a statement, naming her husband out of concern for his mental well-being and to protect our children. Hugh, she said, is suffering from serious mental health issues. As is well documented, he has been treated for severe depression in recent years. The events of the last few days have greatly worsened matters. He has suffered another serious episode and is now receiving inpatient hospital care where he'll stay for the foreseeable future. Once well enough to do so, he intends to respond to the stories that have been published. She said her husband had been first told of the allegations last Thursday. In the circumstances, and given Hugh's condition, I would like to ask that the privacy of my family and everyone else caught up in these upsetting events is respected. I know that Hugh is deeply sorry that so many colleagues have been impacted by the recent media speculation. We hope this statement will bring that to an end. Moments earlier, the Metropolitan Police had confirmed it was not investigating, that there was no evidence to suggest a criminal offence had been committed in the case. 
The BBC had responded, saying having paused its investigation yesterday at the request of the police, it would now restart it with a thorough assessment while continuing to be mindful of its duty of care to all involved. For many, the processing of this news is just beginning. He's the face of the BBC in many ways, particularly in terms of news. Absolutely. I don't think it's quite such a shock. I think the speculation has been so rampant for the last few days that it's more a relief, in a sense, than a shock. The Sun broke the story in its Saturday paper, alleging that a high-profile unnamed presenter at the BBC had paid £35,000 to a much younger person for sexually explicit images, beginning when that younger individual was 17. More allegations were front page every day since, although on Monday the lawyer for the young person said the story was rubbish and nothing criminal had taken place. Some will now be asking whether The Sun has questions to answer for its decisions. Tonight, the paper said it has no plans to publish further allegations. It added that it, at no point in our original story, alleged criminality and also took the decision neither to name Mr Edwards nor the young person involved in the allegations. Why are we not saying to the Sun newspaper, you publish these allegations, you ask the BBC to actually give the detail you wouldn't give? What, what's the Sun's response? Has it got photographs? Has it got details of, of bank transfers and so on? It, it hasn't put them forward and a lot of former tabloid editors are asking the same questions. We must not forget, though, that Hugh Edwards is suspended from the BBC. He may not be facing a criminal investigation, but he is accused of potential misconduct. And if true, there's a family and a young person who are also in trauma. In recent years, Hugh Edwards has publicly shared his struggles with mental health in a Welsh documentary. The future of the United Kingdom is uncertain. Now the man who has held viewers' hands through some of the most significant moments of the nation's history is asking to be left in private. That's BBC News at 10. Whether he can find a way back to health and broadcasting is a question for the future. Don't forget, there's more analysis of the day's... Katie Russell reporting there. Well, Hugh Edwards became a trusted name for millions, presenting this programme and anchoring coverage as some of the most important news stories for the past more than two decades, as our media correspondent David Silito now reports. A very good evening. For the fourth time in the space of five years... When Hugh Edwards took the helm of the BBC's TV election coverage of 2019, it was the first change of presenter in 40 years. There are 650 MPs... When millions are watching at the important moments of British life... Ten seconds. It needs someone who can project reliability, trustworthiness, dignity. Presenting the news is just a part of it. It's the great state occasions. And over the years, only a handful of names have been entrusted with such a role. One of them was Hugh Edwards. Tonight at 10, thousands of police officers deployed across France. His career, from reporting on politics for BBC Wales to being made a lead presenter of BBC TV News, saw him become one of the most familiar faces on British television. Welcome to Windsor for the great royal events, the coming and going of Prime Ministers. Tonight at 10, we're live in Downing Street where Boris Johnson. The one voice that links it all, Hugh Edwards. The serious, reliable, dignified presence for those era-defining moments. Here, the minutes just before the announcement of the death of the Queen. And then suddenly, a newspaper headline changed everything. A TV career of almost 40 years that had taken him to the very top of BBC News, one of the corporation's highest paid and highest profile figures, was off air. And while the guessing game about the BBC presenter at the centre of the week's headlines is now over. There is still much to resolve. David Silito, BBC News. Well, Katie is here along with Dominic Casciani, our legal correspondent. Katie, first of all, the conduct of the Sun through all this, question marks, no question about that. I think there are questions for the Sun to answer. They put out that statement defending their journalism, pointing out that the allegations were always very serious, but that it that paper, it says, never alleged criminality, although that, that story about criminality, potential criminality, was picked up by others. But the paper 
did report from the start that the explicit images had begun when the person was 17, and we know that that would have been potentially criminal if true. So it did, in a sense, set the ball rolling on that, even if it didn't spell it out itself. Now, for the son, they do feel that their story was completely justified, but we haven't seen their evidence, no bank statements or other things to support the story. Yesterday, they came out, published this lengthy editorial, making clear that the son, in the son's view, the story was squarely in the public interest, insisting its reporting was about an alleged abuse of power. But as we've had no way of verifying the allegations, we've had to report the son's stories without the usual scrutiny, while always pointing out that that was the case. The son said tonight, it will cooperate with the BBC's investigation process, but it does look exposed. A presenter is in hospital. Whatever he may or may not have done, it can't be a comfortable position for the son to find itself in. No. And Dominic, you've been filling us in on all the legal implications of this over the last few days, and there's been significant movement on some of that tonight. But there has, Clive, and it's, it's, it's on, the, on the fundamentally the central issue of whether or not there was a criminal offence. And what we have is a situation where the son alleged in its original reporting that a young person had been paid 35000 since they were 17 for sexually explicit images. And what we now know, there was no crime because the police haven't seen any evidence that that took place in that kind of context. They, they gave a statement. This came shortly before the statement from Hugh Edwards' wife, in which detectives from the Met Specialist Crime Command at Scotland Yard said they'd concluded their assessment with what they'd been told and shown by the BBC in terms of the complaint. They'd taken that away and determined there was no information to indicate that a criminal offence had been committed. Now, they didn't just do this on the say-so of what the BBC showed them in a dossier or a file or something. They said they spoke to the BBC, they spoke to the alleged complainant, the alleged complainant's family, they had the assistance of another police force. Now, this wasn't a criminal investigation, but that was, you know, there was a lot of resource put into this. No further police action from Scotland Yard. Alongside that, a separate statement from South Wales Police, and that relates to another part of the Sun's reporting that the family of the young person had tried to report the matter to another police force. And in that statement, the uh, South Wales Police say the information was initially received in April 2023 regarding the welfare of an adult. I think it's worth noting that they don't use the word child, which is something which has appeared repeatedly in the Sun's reporting. Further inquiries the last few days spoke to a number of parties. No evidence of any criminal activity there. So effectively, there's nothing going on with the police. Now, obviously, they've left the door open because they said, you know, sure, someone comes back to us with criminal evidence, you know, potential evidence, we will obviously investigate it. That's what the police do. But at the moment, this is closed for them. What's not closed is the fundamental issue we've been talking about all week, about whether or not there was a risk here of defamation, the harm caused by lies or the risk of privacy. And one just has to wonder where this is going to end up if Hugh Edwards at some point in the future chooses to speak to lawyers about what his options are there. Sure. OK. Dominic, thank you. Dominic Kashiani and Katie Razzle, who we're going to be hearing from a little bit later on in the programme. But as we've just heard, the police have determined there's no evidence of a criminal offence being committed. So now the BBC can resume its own investigation whilst continuing to be mindful of our duty of care to all involved, it said in a statement. Well, our special correspondent Lucy Manning is outside Broadcasting House for us tonight. Lucy, what will this continuing BBC inquiry focus on then? Well, let's start by saying it's been a very difficult day here in the BBC newsroom and um, some of the things we have had to report have been hard to hear. The police have found no criminality, but there's still a lot for the BBC to grapple with. Firstly, and most importantly, how they dealt with that initial complaint about Hugh Edwards. There's also been allegations from The Sun that the presenter broke lockdown rules to go and meet an individual. We reported yesterday on allegations of abusive messages to a person the presenter met, met on a dating app. And there are also questions for the BBC now about the culture in the newsroom relating to that presenter because two BBC employees and one former employee have told BBC News that they received what they believed were 
inappropriate messages from Hugh Edwards. Uh, one told us that the messages were suggestive on social media, that they felt uncomfortable and it left them feeling awkward. And they believed there was a power dynamic in that newsroom that BBC bosses need to deal with and that has been ignored. The BBC say we always treat the concerns of staff with care and would urge anyone to speak to us if they have any concerns. But in the building tonight, very conflicted feelings and the BBC is going to have to work through all of that over the next few days and weeks. OK, thank you, Lucy Manning there at her broadcasting house. And there's more coverage and analysis on Newsnight tonight. That's at uh, 10.30 over on BBC Two. Now in today's other news, leaders from the G7 group of wealthy nations have announced a new security pact with Ukraine. The agreement, which was reached on the sidelines of the NATO summit in Lithuania, pledges more military support for Kyiv. Rishi Sunak heralded the pact as a new high point in international support for Ukraine. President Volodymyr Zelensky stressed it wasn't a substitute for NATO membership, but said he was leaving the summit with a significant security victory for his country. Our Europe editor Katya Adler reports now from the Lithuanian capital, Vilnius. Our dear friend uh, Vladimir Zelensky, President uh, of Ukraine, welcome to you, Vladimir. It's great to have you here. Ukraine may not yet be a member of NATO, not by a long way, but today it was embraced almost as one of their own, taking part in a new council where Kyiv can raise concerns on an equal footing. We've discussed in detail the confrontation with Russia and what can be done to keep Ukrainians safer. We're grateful to our partners for promising new packages of security and defense. This may look like a conveyor belt of schmoozing with world leaders, but you'll notice Ukraine's president always wears combat fatigues. All this glad handing has a concrete purpose. Back home, President Zelensky's country is burning, 500 days into Russia's full-scale invasion. Ukrainians care a lot about NATO. NATO is our only protection from Russia. Otherwise, they'll never leave us alone. If they, they will not help us, I think it, the, the, I don't know, the situation in our country will be the, the much worse than now. In the corridors of power here, there's been lots of debate about why now isn't the time to make Ukraine a full NATO member. But the big picture here is that Ukraine and its defense against Russia's aggression is the focus of all the leaders at this summit. They're pledging long-term humanitarian and military aid, and this despite all of those countries facing a cost of living crisis at home. It's a big deal. Such a big deal, the British Defence Secretary remarked today off camera. He advised Kyiv not to treat allies like an Amazon for weapons supplies. The Prime Minister said he was confident Ukraine's president understood. I know he and his people are incredibly grateful for the support the UK has shown, the welcome that we've provided to many Ukrainian families, but also the leadership that we've shown throughout this conflict. A conflict NATO leaders know could go on for a long time. Don't we need to be honest with people at home here, with voters? This, this could take years, couldn't it? Wars are by nature unpredictable. So I think no one can say with certainty how long this war uh, will last. What we uh, do uh, say or state very clearly is that we will stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. NATO is being careful not to pile pressure on Kyiv over its counteroffensive against Russia. It's tough and slow. The grim reality of war. More from Katya in a moment, but first let's go to our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg, who's in Moscow. Steve, um, one wonders how closely Moscow and the Kremlin have been following events in uh, Vilnius. Very closely. Uh, the Kremlin said so. And I think the Russians were very pleased that Ukraine didn't get what it really wanted uh, from this summit. In other words, a firm timetable for NATO membership. And on Russian state TV today, there was a lot of gloating all day. Having said that, about these G7 security assurances, they did not go down well 
uh, here in Moscow. We had some reaction from President Putin's spokesman Dmitry Peskov who said it would be a mistake and potentially very dangerous uh, for countries to give security guarantees to Ukraine because he said they would infringe on Russia's security. He called NATO an offensive alliance that brought with it instability and aggression. Well, NATO would say that it is a defensive alliance, and as far as aggression is concerned, it wasn't NATO that launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine last year. It was Russia. But basically, the message from Moscow was NATO is anti-Russia. NATO is on the war path. That was the headline in the government paper here today. And that fits in with the wider Kremlin narrative, according to which Russia is a besieged fortress surrounded by enemies, by Britain, by America, by the EU, by NATO, all plotting from morning till night to destroy Mother Russia. Yeah, Katya, to you in Vilnius. Um, the Russians, according to Steve, seemingly pleased with uh, the lack of assurance when it comes to NATO membership for Ukraine. And the summit has revealed divisions within the alliance. Well, yes, but I think if you stand back, what we saw is a West united behind Ukraine against Russian aggression. But what we did see, Clive, is real tension between the realities of war on the one hand, decimating Ukraine, upending stability in all of Europe, and then on the other, the very real domestic political pressures facing all the leaders there. Take Vladimir Zelensky. Because of what his people are going through, they expect him to be able to rock up to a summit like this with a whole wish list for West weapons and a demand for a timetable uh, for NATO membership and they don't really understand why they can't get it. Then look at Joe Biden, he's facing an election in the US next year and on a very delicate tightrope he's pledged billions of dollars of military aid to Ukraine and taken on a leadership role here in Europe over the war. Then look at Rishi Sunak or France's Emmanuel Macron, their countries are facing that cost of living crisis. So the idea of a potential blank check for Ukraine for years and years to come people may not like that so it's tricky sure okay catch you thank you for that catch you adler there in vilnius and a steve rosenberg in moscow many thanks now the bank of england is warning that nearly one million households will see their mortgage payments rise by at least 500 pounds per month by the end of 2026 and around 200,000 people will have to pay even more than that up to a thousand pounds extra Mortgage costs have been rising rapidly as the Bank of England pushes up interest rates to try to curb inflation. But it's not just homeowners who are being hit. Some buy-to-let landlords are either selling up or passing on higher costs to renters, with economists expecting rates to be pushed up even higher next month. Well, our economics editor Faisal Islam is here with more details. Faisal. Yes, Clive. Uh, the Bank of England has calculated who and by how much the mortgage shock will hit as households roll off low fixed mortgage rates and face the reality of the rapid recent rate rises. Overall, by the end of the year, over 3 million mortgage holders face higher payments, 1 million between 200 and 500 pounds per month. But stretch that out to the end of 2026, and you see there 2 million households in that middle bracket, payments up between 200 and 500 pounds a month, and a million households over there a £500 per month increase, that's £6,000 per year. Now, this doesn't just affect homeowners, but renters too. The bank says that landlords on buy-to-let mortgages, often interest only, will see an increase by the end of 2025 of £275 per month. And two in five mortgage landlords would see their rent fail to cover 125% of their mortgages, an important financial threshold. Given all that, it's perhaps surprising the bank thinks overall stress from high debt burdens is manageable. Yes, it's rising, as you can see, to uh, but not to levels seen at the time of the financial crisis in 2007, unless interest rates go much higher. Governor Andrew Bailey confident there'll be no new bank crisis and we won't get a mass property crunch. If you go back to the early 90s, for instance, the recession of the early 90s, um, you know, the rate of repossessions that was, was in there, and obviously the effect that has on people and on families, you know, we don't want to go back to that world. And I think we're in a much better place with a banking system that you know, can support its customers. 
But what's driving all this? There's a run up in the rates markets are willing to lend to major economies, uh, the US and Eurozone here. But as you can see, since the beginning of last year, the UK has begun to diverge somewhat, given the reality of higher inflation stuck above 8% here, whereas today US inflation fell to 3%. As all that gets passed into mortgage rates, not everyone's convinced that it will be pain free. Today's message will be cold comfort for households that are facing really big rise in interest rates, particularly those who are coming off fixed rate mortgages and facing an increase in repayments of something like £3,000 next year. And that's the problem. In a way, the bank wants to squeeze spending power in the economy enough to choke off inflation. But the pain of the process is very concentrated, not everywhere, but on a few million mortgaged households. Clive. OK, Faisal, thank you. Faisal Islam, our economics editor there. Now, it's been another dramatic day's play at Wimbledon where the defending women's champion, Elena Rybakina, has been knocked out by Tunisia's Ons Jabeur. In the men's draw, the Spanish top seed, Carlos Alcaraz, moved into the semi-finals for the first time to face the Russian third seed, Daniel Medvedev. As Andy Swiss reports. Meeting the Queen might make some nervous, but not Flo the search dog. A relaxed welcome to centre court before Her Majesty watched the Majestic. Elena Rybakina against Ons Jabeur, a repeat of last year's final. But would it be the same result? Oh, yes! Well, Jabeur began with her usual swashbuckling brilliance, but Rybakina isn't the champion for nothing. And she took a first set tiebreak. But in Jabeur's hands, a racket becomes a magic wand. Oh, incredible! Winner followed winner, and after seizing the second set, revenge was finally hers. Well, Ange Jabeur will face Belarus's Arena Sabalenka in the semi-finals. In the men's singles, meanwhile, we saw a last dazzling display from one of the stars of these championships. American debutant Chris Eubanks hits the ball so hard you can actually hear the gasps. Oh. Unheralded, unseeded, and utterly inspired. Game, Eubanks. Are you kidding me? Eubanks led third seed Daniel Medvedev by two sets to one before the dream was cruelly dashed. Game, match, the fans here, though, have found a new favourite. Medvedev will now face Carlos Alcaraz. He was up against fellow 20-year-old Holger Rune. If this is the future of tennis, well, it looks bright. But Alcaraz, remember, is the world number one. Threw in straight sets and still very much in with a shout. Andy Swiss, BBC News, Wimbledon. Back now to our top story, Hugh Edwards being named as the BBC presenter who's been suspended over allegations of payments for sexually explicit photographs. Our media editor, Katie Razzle, is back with us. Um, where does all this leave the BBC? Well, Clive, it has been five days of turmoil. Front page news, cameras outside the BBC every day. Uh, the BBC called liars uh, in the sun and suffering reputational damage and an unnamed presenter whose name was all over social media with his reputation in the mud. Throughout, we have always said this story was complex. In a sense, it hasn't got any less complex now that the presenter is named and we know it's Hugh Edwards. Many viewers will be feeling shattered by this, perhaps, that a presenter who's been with them in their homes via the TV is now struggling and in hospital. Uh, there may also be another a family out there, the family at the centre of these allegations, trying to protect their young person, their loved one, at the heart of this story too, who are, who are also suffering. But if we look to the future, what can we say? Clearly, as Dominic was saying earlier, we may find that Hugh Edwards later calls in lawyers, that perhaps he has a case against the son, but he is facing allegations of misconduct, not just from The Sun, uh, and perhaps, but perhaps from others too, including the BBC. We know they're not criminal, but still his future does look in doubt. Can he come back from it? We just don't know. The BBC will continue to investigate, but its investigation will need to tread carefully in light of his mental health issues. It has a duty of care towards him as an employee, and that must be respected. 
that in the end, I do think people will still be processing this news because he has been such an important face of the BBC embodying all those values that the BBC hold, holds dear of trust, reliability, impartiality. So I think this is just a moment to take stock and come, come to terms with it. Indeed, for us all. OK, Katie, thank you. Katie Russell there. Now, time for a look at the weather news and Matt Taylor has all the details. Hi there, Matt. Hi there, Clive. Good evening. I thought I'd start tonight with a search for summer. It seems to be a bit absent for us at the moment. You probably would have thought to look in Lapland, though, where today, this afternoon, temperatures got close to 30 degrees. 12 Celsius above where we should be for this stage in July. But the scorching heat was across the Mediterranean. Malaga got up to 43 degrees through the afternoon. That uh, exceptional heat will push even further eastwards as we go through towards the end of the week. There have been storms breaking out across Central Europe, but I want to draw attention to this area cloud. This is going to hide summer even further away from us as we head towards the end of the week. Now, before it arrives, a bit quieter during the next 24 hours. There's going to be a few showers continuing tonight in the north and the west. Temperatures tomorrow morning fairly similar to this morning. Bright, sunny start, cloud quickly building up and the showers get going yet again. Cloudy conditions, most frequent showers will be across Scotland. Some of those slow moving heavy and thundery, locally some large rainfall totals. But Northern Ireland, England and Wales, fewer showers around and the showers that you see should be a little bit lighter. Winds lighter too, so it will feel just a touch warmer through tomorrow. Finish the day though with cloud and rain towards uh, Northern Ireland. That'll push into Scotland. And then this next developing area of low pressure as we go through into Friday. This is the one which will initially bring strong winds to the southwest of the UK, rattling around the coasts and the hills. Gale force winds here. Outbreaks of rain to start Friday too. Dry start elsewhere, but that rain will extend almost across the UK as we go through Friday. Some of it heavy, some of it thundery. Not too much rain East Anglia in the southeast till later in the day. In the far north of Scotland, we'll avoid the rain until we go into the night. Temperatures around uh, the high teens, low 20s. It's going to feel cooler as the wind strengthens. And the wind will strengthen even further into Saturday. An unseasonably windy spell this weekend with more heavy and thundery downpours and staying cool. Autumn rather than summer, Clive. OK, Matt Taylor, thank you for that. And that's it. More on all of the top stories over on Newsnight with Victoria Derbyshire, which is just getting underway over on BBC Two. But the news continues here on BBC One as we join our colleagues for the news where you are. Have a very good night.